All right, welcome. We're going to review the gut and the health of the gut and what are the most important critical elements for you to understand. If you have gut issues and you're trying to heal your gut, how does the gut work and what are the most important things you need to know to help your gut heal naturally without medications? Maybe you're on medications and you're trying to get off of them or you feel like you're at a dead end with your gut and you're just spinning your wheels, having issue after issue, whether it's acid reflux, gastritis, stomach pain, indigestion, malnutrition, whatever it might be, I've seen it and we help people through this. I'm gonna give you an overview that summarizes the most important elements to consider when you have gut issues and you're trying to have a healthy gut. So let's dig in right here. There's over, first of all, from mouth, food going in to food going out. There's over 30 feet of, of gut tract to consider. There are critical domino effects that happen in order for you to have a healthy poop, for you to have a healthy GI system, for you to absorb nutrients, for your immune system to flourish, for all these microbes to be happy, we have to do certain things and things have to happen in a certain order. Kind of like fixing a Rubik's Cube. There's a, a method, a way of doing that that makes it where all sides are, are, are the same color. So we're gonna start with the mouth because there's a few things just to, to point out. The mouth is more, more than just tasting food. It's more than just taste buds. Your mouth is actually starting the digestive process. And there's certain things happening there that are critical and can work for you in helping heal your gut. One thing that we commonly recommend is a liquid herb. Liquid herbs tend to work more powerfully because it's triggering from squeezing this and putting it in your mouth, it's triggering the brain and stimulating the brain to know what you just put in it and stimulating your body to prepare for as it goes down. So ta taste is one thing and with certain herbs you might not li like the taste but it's going to be more impactful because of the brain connection to that taste. Hopefully that makes sense. You're also going to uh, have glands in your mouth that are going to produce enzymes, helps break down starches. And like when you salivate thinking about pickles or something that, that sounds really good and you start to salivate, those are enzymes that are helping start the breakdown of food before they get into your stomach. So we got, we're going to swallow food and we're going to start this journey of, of following the food down. The first organ we're going to get into is the stomach. The critical thing here that the stomach needs is an acidic environment. It needs to be very high acidic, so we need to make sure that acid is high. One of the most common things with people suffering from acid reflux, where they feel like the food is coming up here, this sphincter here that's supposed to be tight keeping the food in, is, is allowing food to come up allowing certain acid to come in. And what do, what do we do most commonly? We'll take a Tums or an antacid of some kind, maybe it's a, even a prescription, to temporarily lower that to give us relief, which makes sense because if you've ever had bad acid reflux, it's painful. It can keep you up at night. I've had clients who deal with acid reflux constantly for years. They can't sleep. They're, they're always in pain, it's piercing even through their back. So it makes sense you would want relief. And short term, using Tums, using antacids makes sense for the relief. Long term though, however, it doesn't make any sense because it's, it's not fixing the root problem. And over time, you're even lowering the acid further in your stomach. Acid is required for the start of breakdown of certain proteins and carbohydrates. The breakdown of food that happens, usually over three, four hour period of time, needs and requires the acid to break it down. The stomach also produces pepsin, which also helps break down. So what do you do? If you don't have an ulcer in your stomach, 
taking acidic things like betaine HCL, which also has pepsin in it from standard process, or digestive enzymes, digestimes, this has betaine HCL in it. It also has other things we'll go over with the pancreas and gallbladder. Something like that can actually, over time, increase the acid, help you, allow you to break down the, the food and get it moving through your system. You might be having acid reflux from other kinks within this mechanism here, and we'll, we'll dive into that really soon here. We'll go right into the other organs and how that might be influencing the motility of food going, going through your system. But for now, we need, to, we need to talk about how we need acid to help digest and get things going properly through the system. The next step we'll get into as we follow this track down, we could go either way, pancreas or, or, or gallbladder. I'm going to hit the gallbladder next here, liver and gallbladder. The liver is going to produce, well, the liver is going to do a million different things. I'll do another class seminar here on all the things that the liver is doing. I'm also going to interview Dr. Greg, who started a company, a supplement company, where it's grass-fed, grass-finished beef liver. We're going to go over all the details of liver. But for today, we're going to talk about the gallbladder primarily and how the gallbladder stores bile. If you don't have a gallbladder, if your gallbladder was removed, this is critical for you. I can't tell you how many, probably hundreds of clients have told me they don't have a gallbladder and they're struggling with indigestion especially when they're eating fatty foods. Because the primary purpose of the gallbladder is to squirt out bile when it senses food coming out of the stomach into the small intestine, into the duodenum, especially important for digesting fat. And if you don't have a gallbladder, your liver is still cre creating and producing bile, it's just not storing it anymore for when it needs more of it. So when you eat especially a high fatty meal and you don't have a gallbladder or, or your gallbladder is not functioning well, it, it's not producing or giving you the bile you need to help break down the food when it gets to that point. So when we give someone who doesn't have a gallbladder something like digest, digestimes, which has ox bile extract in it, it's amazing. Their digestion starts to happen. They get enough bile to actually start digesting their food properly. And a lot of amazing things happen for their gut health and their stomach pain and indigestion just by giving them something that simple. The gallbladder, what you need to know about that is it's going to help you digest your fat. That's primarily what you need to know about that. Most commonly, people do have gallbladder issues, especially around the holidays. You're eating a lot of fatty foods and unhealthy foods, Thanksgiving, Christmas, that sort of thing. We see a lot of gallbladder flare-ups or attacks that time of year. So something you need to know about gallbladder, and for any of you that don't have a gallbladder, do yourself a favor and get some ox bile. I like the Digestimes from Designs for Health, but there are others. The next organ I'm going to hit is the pancreas. The pancreas is primarily going to release digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes are going to help break down your fats. They're going to help uh, break down protein, and they're going to help break down carbohydrates. There's a number of uh, enzymes that are released and some call them proteolytic enzymes. Pineapple has enzymes in it, proteolytic enzymes, and papaya has enzymes in it. Proteolytic just means it's helping break down protein. One trick I will tell you, when you want support for your gut health, you can take enzymes, again, digestive enzymes, has enzymes in it, amylase, um, protease type of enzymes, Multi, what is it called? Multizymes from standard process has uh, papain and bromelain in it, which both bromelain comes from pineapple 
and papain comes from papaya. When you're taking those with food, they're going to help you digest your food. A trick, just a side note, is if you take multizymes, papain, and bromelain on an empty stomach, it will be used some for digestion that needs to happen, but it's going to end up in your bloodstream and it's going to circulate through your system and help break down protein elsewhere, commonly in the joints. So if you have arthritis and you take enzymes on an empty stomach, it can actually help break down fibrin, a protein commonly produced in arthritic patients, clients, and it will help decrease pain of arthritis on an empty stomach. But when it comes to digestion, the pancreas, you need to know that you need enzymes for this process to happen properly. I want to just pause and tell you that bitters, bitters like gentian root, which are in this product called Digest Ease that we carry, this actually stimulates your body to produce its own enzymes its own pancreatic enzymes. It's going to help the gallbladder produce more bile, stimulate it, and it's also going to help the stomach to increase more acid naturally. So digestive enzymes like this, digestzymes, has all of that in it when we need extra support, which this is common that we need the extra support. When we want to get make sure the body is doing its own job at producing all those things, we use digestes bitters to help stimulate as, that as well. So hopefully that makes sense, starting from the mouth down to the stomach, down to the gallbladder, down to the pancreas. This, this is where over half or the majority of your digestion and breakdown of foods is actually happening. Majority of that's happening in this upper GI section. Now here I'm going to go over just a few things we find on the GI map which is a poop test that we run in the office to see people's digestive health and ev everything we can see is going to be on this, di this GI map minus things like endoscopies and colonoscopies where it's visually going in there. Th what I'm going to show you is when you don't have enough stomach acid, one of the most common problems that result is a bacterial overgrowth of H. pylori. If someone has H. pylori overgrowth, they don't have enough acid in the stomach. So H. pylori is very common bacterial overgrowth. We see probably over half of our clients with H. pylori hidden infections. And one of the things that's a result of, of why that's flourishing is that you have low acid. So we're going to make sure to increase the acid in those clients and we're going to give them things that attack and are antibacterial to help kill off those H. pylori uh, infections. Now, when it comes to other things on the GI map, we also notice fungi and yeast flourishing with, with issues with the upper GI because we're not breaking down our sugar and we're eating too much sugar and it's not breaking down effectively. And we need to make sure all these are supported and we need to limit the sugar, especially the refined sugar, to allow our bodies to heal from a candida fungus yeast overgrowth. Remember, the acid environment of the stomach and the pepsin being produced from the stomach in the right environment is what's allowing you to have an antibacterial and an antifungal environment for your gut. So if you can start to see the importance of acid and the right acidic and pepsin environment and the domino effects on digestion and if it's low acid the risk of H. pylori and fungus and bacterial overgrowth becomes substantial and we see it all the time. Parasites are very very common. They have teeth. They're they're latched on here so they don't like to come out. Commonly on the poop test, the GI map test, we don't even see them because they don't like to come out. One thing I will, I will tell you is that we won't rely on a, a GI map to tell us if you have a parasite. We're going to actually 
look at other digestive markers as well to figure out if you have a parasite. The intestinal health markers on the GI map test, it, the one that I'm going to talk about here is steatocrit, and that's your ability to, um, to digest fat. And elastase is going to be that marker that is telling us how much uh, digestive enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, are in there. And we'll commonly see those off when we have issues with our upper GI. Our immune system is happening because of all of this. If you have low acid, not enough bile being produced, and not enough digestive enzymes, you're going to not only have a lower, weaker immune system, because now you're allowing different bacteria to get into the small intestine, the large intestine, but you're also going to be malnourished. Your body isn't breaking things down enough. Your body's not getting the nutrition that it needs into your system. And the pancreas is the major organ for upper GI digestion. And so when people have issues with pancreatitis or cancer of the pancreas, oftentimes the struggle and the issue is they're malnourished. Having good upper GI digestion, good physiology here, is going to help you with nourishing your body and making sure you're getting the good nourishment from the foods you're eating. And we'll use supplementation as well to make sure that that's happening. But on a side note, supplements don't always work and the foods you're eating aren't always working. A, if you're not taking the right ones or you're taking synthetic ones, but B, if your gut can't handle digesting them properly, even a supplement, it's not going to actually digest it and break it down enough to actually get absorbed into your system. Hopefully this is making sense. When we get into the small intestine and the large intestine, there's hundreds of different things we could talk about, but the main one I want to go over is the microbiome and the gut lining itself. I want to talk about intestinal permeability. And that word right there is just the lining of the gut and the cells of the gut that make up the lining. It needs to be tight and almost like a N95 breathing mask. You're, you're wanting to still breathe, but you're not wanting certain microbes to come in and out. Your gut is the same way. It's your filter lining to get to your bloodstream. So if this were your gut lining, and this were your blood, blood streams and blood cells here. We want certain nutrients to be digested and absorbed and get into the bloodstream to circulate through your body so your body gets what it needs. But we don't want crap and toxins and mycotoxins and bacteria to be leaking out of your gut lining and making it into your bloodstream and circulating to your brain. That, that is how this term leaky gut or intestinal permeability is affecting almost everything in your body. Primarily the things connected to this though are the gut brain connection and with, with mental, mental health issues, anxiety and depression and the connection with cognitive decline and gut issues with the brain. That's how it's getting there. It's getting out of the gut into your bloodstream, getting to your brain. The other thing that's happening here is that when, the, when these particles, that, these foreign particles that aren't supposed to go into your gut, are going into your gut, you're going to trigger two main responses here. You're going to trigger, yeah, I got room here. You're going to trigger inflammation. And you're going to trigger antibodies which are in response to this foreign, foreign matter. And that's going to trigger an immune response. So immune response. Now, that means every time you eat all day, you're going to be triggering inflammation and an immune response. Now, if you do that for years, at a time, it makes sense why people's gut issues domino effect and cause 
uh, autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders like MS, um, you, have, you have rheumatoid arthritis, th these ulcerative colitis, these autoimmune disorders, research is now getting further and further and more and more into showing a, a really strong correlation between gut issues and autoimmune disorders. Of course, inflammation makes sense because your body's going to react negatively and your arthritis is going to get worse. Your pain levels are going to get worse because of the inflammation. So leaky gut, intestinal permeability, this is a big, big reason that people are having health issues. If your stomach had enough acid, gallbladder is produced right, and your, your digestive enzymes were working right, if your upper GI was, was dialed in and, and microbes were lowered, killed those off, now you're giving your gut lining a chance to actually heal. That's really real important step and process to healing your gut naturally. That does take time for the intestinal wall to heal and tighten up. Things like collagen over time, once you get rid of and get this cascade going properly, get rid of infections, now you start getting collagen promoting things into your diet, supplement into your diet, and support the microbiome. The last thing I want to cover when it comes to your gut health and intestinal health is this word called gut dysbiosis, which is really just an imbalance of good, healthy microbiome bacteria and bad opportunistic bacteria. So on the GI map test, we look at all the bad pathogenic type bacteria and viruses. We look at the H. pylori, the fungus and yeast, but we also test the normal bacteria, the healthy bacteria, the probiotic of the body. And we wanna see if, is it, is it low or is it high? And if it's low and high and there's infections, you have what's called gut dysbiosis, this imbalance of good and bad bacteria. And how do we go about healing the gut naturally when you have gut dysbiosis, when you have leaky gut and you have hidden gut infections? We start to attack what the specific, the specific infections that we find on your GI map, we start to attack that properly we start to look at making sure your body has enough acid, your stomach, your gallbladder is stimulated and producing enough bile to digest your fat, that your digestion enzymes are working for you to help break those foods down. Now, something to know about the foods we're eating and the most common foods that are inflammatory and cause issues with your gut health. These are just general categories that will help you. One of them is alcohol. The, the second is dairy. The third is wheat and gluten associated with that. And the fourth is refined sugars. Commonly, you will be recommended, if you're trying to heal your gut, to limit and avoid eating those foods, to give your system a chance to lower the inflammation and to give your digestion a break from having to try to digest those inflammatory, hard to digest foods. The way to be very specific about what foods are actually causing inflammation and what foods are causing an immune response in your body is by doing a food sensitivity test. The finger prick food sensitivity test we use We'll test 300 different foods, probably 99% of your daily diet. And it's going to test for antibodies, these things that respond to certain foods in your body and trigger an immune response. IgG antibodies is what it's testing. And IgE antibody is what they test when we look for allergies. Food allergies, seasonal allergies, certain allergies are going to produce a different antibody. But when you get a food sensitivity test, it's super nice because now you know if a food is triggering immune response and inflammation, we can just lower eating those, stop eating those, and you know which ones they are. We had a client, an Italian, Italian family, loves his pasta, loves tomatoes, loves, uh, it eats super healthy, and he was having a lot of gut issues. He 
did a food sensitivity test, found out he was sensitive to chia seeds, which he was putting in his smoothies every day, which is a, which is a health food, right? Tomatoes, eating m most majority of the days, and garlic. These are the three I can remember right off the top of my head. This is something he was having in his diet regularly. And I want to just point out that not one food on the planet is known to be healthy for everybody. Because everyone's body and digestive system is in different states. And food sensitivities really are a symptom of bad gut health. So typically what we see is when we start to heal gut health issues, get rid of infections, get digestion happening properly, healing intestinal permeability, we will see a number of food sensitivities go away because your body no longer needs to react with an immune response or react in, with inflammation. It doesn't, I'm not trying to say that every time we heal someone's gut, all their food sensitivities or allergies go away. What we do commonly see is that when we heal gut issues, food sensitivities, certain foods can go away because they can just be a symptom of bad gut health. Let me make sure I covered everything I wanted to cover here. I probably didn't, and which is why we do more videos. But I think this is a good starting point for you for a review of gut health, a review of certain organ systems, a review of certain infections that happen be because of them, and certain helpful tips for you that you can try to apply starting today if you want. You can try to start things like digestive enzymes. The microbiome product that I enjoy more and commonly recommend over a probiotic is Ion Gut Health. Ion Gut Sport, actually, sorry. This is more of a soil-based organism that's going to naturally flourish the microbiome, and it's actually going to help tighten up these leaky gut junctions, these, this, this intestinal permeability. I like this product. I also love digestive bitters stimulating the mouth, the, the herb itself in the mouth, and helping your bile production in your gallbladder, your stomach acid, and your pancreatic enzymes. So these are just a few helpful recommendations, and I hope this video you found really helpful.